If you watch this video, you are going to be better prepared for the CMA exams. These examination practice questions were created by the IMA itself, and it has a full package of over about 400 multiple choice questions and additional essay questions. It is accessible to the public. So if you are interested in having access to it, check the video description below and click on the link. I also have a cheat sheet with formulas and um, other contents that you need to know to be better prepared for the CMA examination. I'm going to go through a series of questions for series of videos. I will solve 10 questions for each, um, each video. So I recommend that you watch the following videos that will be posted and also watch my previous videos on what to expect on the CMA exams and things. So before I start solving the question, I want you to pause the video and then solve it and then compare your answer with mine. My goal is that I help you to be efficient and effective with your time management and also choosing the correct answer without wasting too much time. So, you know, with a CMA, you have 1, 1 minute 48 seconds per each uh, question on average, all right? So we have, we have the first question here, okay? Once I see this, this is a lot of information, okay? Especially information with data. I am not going to read everything. I'll go straight to what is required of me or the question that I need to, um, or question that I need to answer. So here, and usually it is at the, it's at the last paragraph. So the company has opportunity to spend additional $10,000 in promotional expenditure on either Sparta or Vota, anticipating 10% increase in sales volume as a result. Both product lines have idle capacity and can support increase in unit volume. The company should spend the additional promotional expenditure on, all right. Okay, so we are going to make a decision whether to invest the 10,000 promotion expenditure in Sparta or the 10,000 promotion expense in Vota. Okay, and we will increase uh, our sales volume by 10%. It says idle capacity and can support the increased unit volume. That means face cost is irrelevant because it's going to stay the same. First cost is not going to change because there's idle capacity. So whether we increase it or we don't increase it, we're still going to incur the 500,000 and the 0,000. So this is irrelevant. Okay, we're not going to make decision based on that. But we're going to make decision based on the increases. So increase in profit and increase in cost and see the, pro, uh, the operational profit. So increase in profit will be the contribution margin, which is selling price minus variable cost. So I'm going to do Sparta here, Sparta and water. You don't need to write this on your scrap paper on the CMA exams, you can go ahead. I can go ahead and do this straightforward without you know, labeling it, but for the sake of understanding, that is why I'm doing this. So contribution margin per unit. With Sparta, we have $10 minus, uh, minus $7, I mean $3. Okay, so that gives us contribution margin of seven and uh, voter 10 minus 20 gives us a contribution margin of 10. We are going to multiply that by increasing unit. An increase in unit, if we have 100,000 right now and it's going to increase by 10%. So that means we are going to have an increase of 10,000 units. And uh, 20,000 multiplied by 10%, we are going to have an increase in 2,000 units for voter. So we multiply the two and we have 70,000 total contribution margin. So total CM, and we have 20,000 total CM for voter. Now the additional cost is 10,000. So we are incurring this additional cost, okay? So that's the relevant cost, 10,000 and 10,000. So operational, um, operating profits will increase if we invest in Sparta by 60,000. And if we invest in water, operating profit will increase by 10,000. So we know that we need to increase, we need to invest in, uh, we need to invest in water we need to invest in Sparta, sorry. We need to invest in Sparta because it's increasing profit by $60,000. So when I go to my multiple choice question, 
I quickly eliminate C and D because we were not going to invest in water. Okay, so I came to A and B. I said invest in Sparta. Don't go ahead and select A because it says invest in Sparta. Invest in Sparta because it will generate additional profit of ten thousand. The ten thousand profit is from water, not Sparta. So A is not the correct answer, and B is obviously the correct answer. Sparta because it will generate an additional. Um, 60,000 operating profit. So the correct answer for question number one is B. Sparta, because it will generate additional profit of 60,000. So let's move on to question number two. Question number two, a profit maximizing company is considering price increase. So the consider price increase on a particular product. After extensive market research, the company determined that demand for product is price inelastic. Assuming all other factors uh, remain constant, determine what course of action the company should take with the resulting impact on quantity demand. Okay, so management is thinking whether we should increase the price, and if we increase it, what impact will it have on quantity demand? And the price is price inelastic. We have inelastic, uh, price elasticity, there are two types of it, inelastic and elastic. There are <clears throat> more than two, although. So inelastic, think about a rubber band that you put on the hand. So if you have a rubber band like this and you stretch it, okay, you stretch it, inelastic is not gonna stretch that much. So that is less, you know, impact on stretching it. But if it is elastic, when you stretch it, it stretches a lot. Okay, so there's significant impact on elastic. So we, for with price, because it's inelastic, if we change the price, quantity demand will be low. Okay, there's, there will be less impact on quantity demand. So for instance, if we have, we sell a product for $1 and we increase the price to $5. So let's assume 10 people buy. Okay, now we will have about, seven people buying it, only three people will not buy it. But if it's elastic and we increase the price and we have 10 people buying it, okay, we will have about only two people buying it now. So there will be a significant impact on quantity demanded, okay? Or the number of goods that one uh, customer buys will reduce. <clears throat> so because this is inelastic demand, uh, the price elasticity of demand, okay, this is not asked here, but so you will remember when you get other questions, they, Elasticity is less than one, and uh, elasticity, if it's elastic, is greater than one. Okay, so now we know that it will have less or minimum impact on quantity demanded. So we know that we should increase the price. And A and B says do not increase the price. So we are going to eliminate A and B and go to C and D. So this I've taken this, you can use an example as well. Just eliminate them so you don't spend too much time on it because it do not increase, do not increase. So increase price, increase price, minimum impact on quantity demand. That is correct. Okay, if we increase the price, we'll have a minimum impact of quantity because it's inelastic. Okay, uh, the demand will not be affected that much. So the correct answer for question number two is C, increase price, minimum impact on quantity demanded. Question number three. Okay. Question number three says, which one, and by the way, recommendation, pause the video and solve the question and compare it with mine. Which one of the following is not correct regarding the value of option? These questions are always almost tricky because if you don't pay attention to not, you are going to choose the correct one, okay? So let's go through and see which one is not correct. As the stock price increases, the value of put option decreases, but the value of a call option increases. So that is correct. Since it's correct statement, we are not going to select that. The higher the strike price, the lower the value of call option and the higher the value of put option. Yes, that is also correct. So the both increases. The value of a put option is adversely related to the rates free interest rate. And the value of a call it's possibly related to the risk free interest. That is also a correct statement. And then we have volatility. Okay, so what volatility does is volatility um, increase call and also increase uh, put. 
Okay, that's both increase and that. So volatility of the underlying stock increases the value of call option but decreases. Okay, so this is not a correct statement here. Here, this statement is correct, but this statement isn't correct. With the put of it. So a correct answer for question number three is D, volatility of uh, the underlying stock increases the value of call option, but decreases the value of put option, which is not correct. So it's the correct answer. Question number three, uh, question number four, sorry. All right, element of project risk identification include which of the following? All right, so what would you do to investigate risk? Uh, think you do things like document, you find a document, uh, you gather document, you will look into electronic evidence and you do interviews. Interviews is actually uh, regarded as one of the most effective ones, interviews and some like public searches. Okay, so now that I know these are some things I would do to investigate risk or risk identification, I'll go through the, my answer choices and see which answer is correct. So I see interview here right away. So I'm going to select that because that's the most effective one. So I'll go ahead and select that. So the correct answer for um, question number four is C, interviews and observation. One thing that helps is once you answer the question in your mind, and you know what it is. When you answer the question, you sometimes define something and you know the definition. You don't spend too much time on answer choices because you know exactly what it is. Okay. So question number five, employee, uh, employee A observes employee B, uh, observes that employee B is improperly altering department records. So altering department record to meet month and goal. These records are for internal use only and do not impact the company financial records. Employee A notifies supervisor, supervisor of the impropriety and the supervisor advises employee B that uh, she instructed employee B to alter uh, the records and an adjustment will be made uh, the subsequent month to correct the records. Employee A, sure. All right. So employee A finds that uh, employee B is doing something unethical and talks to the supervisor. And supervisor is apparently involved in it. So what should employee A do? One of the main things employee A should do is to check the company's code of ethics. Okay, procedures, okay. Code of ethics in solving this uh, dilemma. So this is an ethical dilemma, okay. And wants to see if there's any retaliation. Okay, and then go to the next, next in authority, the next in authority that is above the supervisor, next authority. And then he could talk to his lawyer, his personal lawyer, and uh, if all you know does not come, do not come through, and then call the IMA hotline. Okay, call the IMA hotline. So we're going to see what this employee should do, okay? Which one is correct? Advise the supervisor that her behavior was unethical and do not communicate the info, but that is not a way to go about this issue. So A is not the correct answer. B, follow the organization established procedure on the resolution of such conflict. Yep, so that is what I explained here. So a correct answer seems to be B. The correct answer seems to be B, but let's let's see what C and B say. Do not, do nothing since the supervisor authorized the behavior. Now, so here, you know, with the IMA standard credibility, credibility is communicating deficiencies and limitations. So you need to apply uh, the credibility here and do something about it. They communicated the unethical behavior to external authorities. That is not what to do. So the correct answer here is B, follow the company's established procedure and resolution in such conflict. Question number six, my recommendation, pause the video, and solve it yourself, and then compare your answer with, with mine. One of the questions I love is question like this that has data. I don't read anything. I just go straight forward and read the question of what I'm required of. So here we are required to the company's rate of return on asset. 
and rate of return on equity. So that means it has to be respectively. Okay, so rate of return for year two is. Okay, so one, what is our rate of return on asset or return on asset? So return on asset, ROA equals net income divided by average total asset. Okay, when you look through this, they all have zeros. Okay, so we have, uh, they all have three zeros at the end. Okay. You can ignore the three zeros so you can save time in calculation with your calculator and everything. You can ignore the three zeros and all do um, the other zeros. Okay, so that's that help you know reduce the time, the amount of time you spend typing, you know, on your calculator and also writing on your sheet. So we are solving for year two. So that means our numerator will come from year two, which is the 75. So 75 net income divided by average total asset. Average total asset will be this 600 plus this 500. Okay, so year one and year two together. So 600 plus 500 divided by two. Okay, so we have here 75 divided by 550. 75 divided by, let me write that one well. 75 divided by 550, which equals 0.1364, or you run it up 14%. Okay. So we know return on assets has to be 14%. So A is not correct, D is not correct, and C seems to be the correct one. But if you are doubting if uh, B is close, so that might be the right one, uh, that might be a possible answer, you can go ahead and solve return on equity. But if I were doing this on the CMA, I'm not going to solve ROE or return on equity. I will choose C because that is the correct answer. But let's see ROE. So return on equity equals so net income divided by average total equity. Okay, so our net income is gonna stay 75 divided by average equity. So we don't have equity here, but we know that asset equals liability plus equity. Okay, we have um, we have asset, we have liability, so we need to move it here and do asset minus liability equal to equity. So we need to find our equity, okay, and do the average of the equity. So what we're going to do here, we're going to have um, total asset for year one, 600 minus 300. Okay. And then we add the total asset, I mean, total equity for year two as well, which is the 500 asset minus 225 equity, I mean, 225 liability. Okay. So we do the 500 asset minus 225 liability. That gives us a equity. 600 asset minus 300 liability that will give us equity and everything that we have here divided by two. Okay, and you can go ahead and put that in your calculator to solve it and you will have 75 divided by 287.5, which gives us 26.09%. And when you run it up, it's 26% right here. So that is why question number six, C is the correct answer, 14% for ROA, return on asset, and 26% for return on equity. Question number seven. A publicly traded company is planning to divest. Okay, divest this will be a, divest the division A for 100, 100 million. Private investors have pulled their capital of uh, 10 million and plan to finance the balance of 90 million. Uh, via debt financing, division A asset as collateral, okay? The new owners plan to give the new management a bigger state, stake in the company by providing stock options. They also redesigned performance measures and incentive schemes for employees to minimize inefficiency and bureaucracy. This scenario most closely describes, okay, first, 
there is a definition that is given in this statement. If you know that definition for uh, one of these or all of these, you can straight up go ahead and choose your answer. But if you don't know, I'm going to go through with her. First, com the company is selling the division, getting rid of it, okay? And it costs 100 mil. A private investor comes and want to buy it, 100 million, but they only have cash for 10 million and debt. They're going to use debt, 90 million, okay? With um, assets as collateral. This is a definition for leverage buyout. This is a definition for leverage buyout. We use significant amount of debt. Um, to purchase asset and then we use the asset as collateral. This is the definition of leverage buyout. But assume you don't know the definition. We are using debt. Debt, uh, increase in debt is a leverage. This is a financial leverage. The private company has a financial leverage, increasing their financial leverage. So we know this has to do with leverage. So I will go ahead and eliminate A and B. And now I have only C and D. So my chances of getting this correct, if I don't know the definition, is now 50%. So I have 50-50. All right. So leverage recapitalization is um, acquiring debt. You get the debt and you pay dividends. Acquiring debt to pay dividend. That is the leverage uh, recapitalization. So the definition that fit in here and also what we have remaining is D. So the correct answer for question number seven is D, leverage buyout. Question number eight. Um, okay. If the term structure of interest rate has a flat slope, all right, which of the following statement is correct? All right, again. So we have, it looks like this, the yield and we have maturity. Okay. This is the easiest thing to know. If it's flat, it means there's no changes. There's no difference. They are the same. You know, the long, uh, we are talking about long term. So this is talking about long term and short term. If they are flat, it's the same. There's no difference. Okay? That means long term rate equals short term rate. If it goes up, that means long is greater than short, okay? Because if it's going up, it's long. When you take a ladder and you put it on the wall and it goes up, it's long, okay? So that's one thing you can uh, you know, use to remember things. You know, a ladder, you pull it up, it's long. Okay, you pull it down, yeah, short, okay? So that is long um, greater than short. And if it's going down long, it's less than short. And if it's like this, that is intermediate, okay? So once you know this, know that what the flat means, easy for you to select your answer. You know, uh, A says long-term rate are higher. No, because it has to go up like this to make it higher. Long-term rate are the same. So that is, no, this is not correct answer. That is the flat. So B is the correct answer. So question number eight is B. Long-term rates are the same as short-term rate because it's flat. The intermediate one, which is C, um, would have been something like this, okay? So let's move on to question number nine. A company has a strong internal control structure in its accounting department. So in my mind, I know what this question is going to be about once I read this, internal control or risk. Okay, it has a high degree, so we have a, okay, it, uh, it has a high degree, so high degree of segregation, regular reconciliation, strict interviews, um, comprehensive internal audit. It is granted fixed asset accountant, so I said uh, accountant that is not certified, has been contemplating. So keyword here, contemplating the measurement, okay, of cash receipt processed by the account receivable department. The accountant plans to use these funds to sustain his gambling problem. Using the four triangle module, what is the best assessment uh, for this risk, uh, for the uh, risk for the company's situation? Okay, good. 
for a triangle, we have three of them and I call it pro. So pro, P is pressure. R is rationalization. O is opportunity. And remember, opportunity is the only one management can prevent or reduce. Okay, that's the only one management can prevent. So if we have one of these, only if we have only one, the risk is low. If we have two, the risk is medium. If we have three, the risk is high. If we have all of them. So we are going to decide whether the risk is low, medium, or high. And which ones do we have here? <clears throat> do we have pressure? Okay, pressure. Um, yes, we have pressure because why, why does he need the cash for his gambling problem? So we know there's a pressure or a problem that he has, okay? That is pressuring him to uh, want to embezzle fund. So pressure is, uh, pressure exists. So we have low, at least we have low. Rationalization, do we have rationalization? He's contemplating, that's thinking about it, rationing. Or if I took it, it's okay, everyone does it or something like that. So there is rationalization. So we know it's not going to be low, okay, because this rationalization is so going to be at least medium or high. Opportunity, does opportunity exist? Is the company doing everything to minimize the opportunity or reduce or get rid of or avoid it? Yes, because there's a high degree of duty of segregation. There's a regular reconciliation. There's strict in reviews. There's comprehensive internal audit. So opportunity does not exist. So we know that uh, the risk is uh, medium risk. So High is not the correct answer. We're going to get rid of high. And then we have two mediums, B and C. All right, medium, because opportunity is absent. Yes, opportunity is absent. So C <coughs> looks like the correct answer. B looks like the correct answer. But let's, let's, let's look at C. Medium, because rationalization is absent. There is a rationalization. He was contemplating the embezzlement. So a correct answer for question number one is B, medium, because opportunity is absent. Now, question number 10. So this will be the last question for this video and I will continue in the next video. Uh, I will solve only 10 questions per each uh, video. And I recommend also that you pause the video, solve it, and then compare your answer uh, to mine. And also feel free to check the video description below to click on the link to have access to this package and also with the cheat sheet to help you prepare for the examination. If a corporation, question number 10, has the option to use either short period or long period, okay, to amortize a pattern, and it can use either declining method and straight method to depreciate a fixed asset, the corporation will be considered to have better earning quality. Okay, if it is, it uses. Okay, so earning quality. Earning quality is how financial statement reflect true performance, true performance. All right, so one of the example is LIFO and FIFO. If the company uses LIFO, that means they are reporting the cost at current price. And that reflects the true performance because that's at the current price. If they use FIFO, they are reporting the cost at old price, maybe 1990s, and it's not current. <clears throat> the cost is not current. So LIFO reflects a true performance. So that is that is the ending quality. Okay. And also when you're choosing between declining and straight, remember that the declining reflect more true performance than straight line. Declining reflect true performance more than straight line. So when I go through my options here and I'm going to eliminate answer choices that have straight lines. We have straight line method, straight line methods. So I'm going to eliminate D and B. So I have A and C remaining, okay? <clears throat> Which they both have declining balance method. All right, longer period. A longer period to amortize the pattern and shorter period to amortize the pattern, okay. 
when you stretch and make amortization for so long, it doesn't reflect true, true performance. But amortizing it, speeding it up, or using the expenses uh, to, uh, uh, that reflect the use of amortization as, the ref as a better reflection of true performance. So the shorter it is, the better it is. So question C is correct. We don't want to extend it to make it long. So true any quality seems to um, have expenses reflect true performance okay, by expanding it the way it should be. So the correct answer for question number 10 is C, shorter period um, to amortize the patent and the declining method for uh, fixed asset. All right, you need the cheat sheet that I have and you need this package. So check the video description below, click on the link and you will have access to the cheat sheet with formulas uh, that you can cut them. I've designed it in a way that you can cut them into uh, index cards or flashcards that you can review wherever you are. If you are preparing for the examination, I wish you very good luck.